Hi there guys and welcome to the Tantrum Show. In this episode we're going to be going through again the questions that you guys have sent in over the last few weeks and answering those. If you have got any questions that you'd like me to answer in an upcoming episode, please just drop me a mail, sam at tantrumkitesurf.com or use one of you know, any of our social media channels or the usual ones, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, all these ones. Send us a message on there and I'll get back to you and answer in this format. Again, I'll do it in this format rather than an email. A, because we can be visual, you know, give you some visual tips as well, which often helps. But also, I'm much better at talking than I am at writing. You know, I, I, I hate typing. I'll probably give you a very, very brief answer so I can get away from the computer, where I can be a bit more verbose and go into a bit more detail as well. Hopefully answer the question a bit more in a bit more depth for you. Okay? Questions on kite surfing. Not in relationship to anything like that. In fact, I'm probably the last person that you want to be asking about relationship advice. Kite surfing, yes, we can do that. Okay, so keep the question related to kite surfing, okay? Because we have had some strange ones coming in these last few weeks, okay? Um, so the first one, and I do apologise, I've lost the names from the people who've, re who've written into these. And I've still got the questions, but I've just lost the names. As I was trying to match the toe side, find it very difficult to ride toe side without being able to ride one-handed, yet this isn't an automatic skill. Okay, so how do you ride one-handed, basically? Well, the thing you've got to realise about one-handed, what we're generally trying to do when we ride one-handed is not move the kite. It's very, very difficult to move the kite when we've only got one hand, because either you pull it and it goes all the way up and you can't get it back down again, or if you've got it in the middle, you know, you, you really haven't got much leverage. So the idea when we're riding one-handed, first of all, is that we're not trying to move the kite. And this is the mistake I see a lot of people make before they even start, you know, especially when they're trying to ride toe side. You go to the toe side and suddenly your stance is a lot less efficient, and you'll actually see this later on in the video that we talk about, or you start heading downwind towards the kite. So everything slows down, suddenly you need a lot more power. Now, because you're riding toe side, you're riding one-handed. So you think, well, I've still got to move the kite. But you just can't. You can't move the kite anywhere near as fast or efficiently with one hand as you can with two. And in fact, you know, I would argue that when you're riding with one handed, the last thing you want to be trying to do is generate power through the kite because you just haven't got the leverage to do it. Unless you want to be constantly moving your hand around, it's not going to work. So the key to riding one handed, I would say, is the grip that you use. Now you've got a few options. You can obviously, you can grab, so let's say you're, you know, the kite's up here, you're flying the kite here. You've got a few options to where you can put your hand. You can have it at the end of the bar or in the middle of the bar or somewhere in between. You know, you want it in the top half of the bar. The advantage, you can actually have it at the top of the bar, the end of the bar or somewhere higher up is that you've got a lot of leverage. You know, you can very quickly move the kite in that direction. However, I would argue most of the time, 99% of the time, that's not what you want to do. You, know, you want to aim for your default setting of one-handed flying to be in the middle of the bar. Why? Because again, the idea is that you haven't got the leverage then to move the kite. Now, why, why would you want that, you're asking? Okay, think about when you're flying the kite one-handed. Think about, first of all, on the beach, you know, why do you need to fly the kite one-handed? Well, to pick up your board to get yourself into the water, okay? What happens? Let's say you've got your hand at the end of the bar. Even better example, you've got your hand at the end of the bar, you've got your board in your hand and you're walking towards the beach. Here in Spain, women love to sunbathe topless. There are some very attractive women around here, especially at the moment in the summertime. One of these said women starts walking past you in that direction. What do you do? But as you do that, as your head follows her, what you also naturally do is that, and it's an instinctive reaction, not to do with her being topless, but just to do with the fact that you're making the motion. The other one, you bend down to pick up the board, and when you stand up, you pull yourself up. You pull yourself up on the bar. And if you've got your hand at the end of the bar, whoomph, the kite disappears. The other time we see this when people are body dragging, people are body dragging back to their board, they've got their hand at the top of the bar, they just come to the board, they go to reach out for the board, they pull the bar in, whoomph, and they just miss the board and they're off again, okay? All to do with having your hand at the end of the bar. But this is a problem when you're riding as well because the same thing happens. That basically, any time you lose concentration on what you're doing, you lose focus and your hand's at the end of the bar, whoomph, that kite's gone. So I would suggest you want your default setting to be hand in the middle of the bar. So that even if you do lose concentration and you do have this natural reaction to pull this hand in, not a lot happens. Or it happens very slowly. 
okay? So that's the first thing. Try and have your hand in the middle of the bar. The second thing that's mega important when you do this is the grip that you use, okay? Now this seems very nitpicky, but it's a massively important point. The grip that we always teach is this. I'm going to turn around to show you. So it's, if you imagine the bar's coming through here, the trim line is coming through here, so you've got three knuckles above the bar, one finger that's straight, now this is crucial, and a thumb that's straight, okay? So, three knuckles, this gives you leverage up because gravity itself is gonna pull the kite down all the time. Gravity is always working to pull the kite down, so you need more leverage going up. But we tend, again, you know, that tends to the natural reaction. So you'll still tend to steer the kite over. Now, if you've got that finger bent, you've got very little leverage to pull the kite back down again. If that finger's straight, you've suddenly got all this leverage to move the kite down. So that's what I would suggest. I would suggest grip is the most important part. This straight finger is one of the most important parts of it because it gives you that leverage to get the kite down, which is what most people seem to suffer with when flying the kite one-handed. It's very, very easy to bring the kite up. It's very difficult once it's up here to bring it back down. And that is what that straight finger achieves. It just means you can, you've got the leverage to, and it's still not gonna be easy, but it just gives you a bit more leverage to tilt the bar down. Because this is a very unnatural movement. You've not got a lot of strength along your joints in that way. So it's a very unnatural movement to go back down again, okay? So the other two things I would say, key, key, key for, for one-handed. Hand in the middle and that kind of, what you call pistol grip, I suppose, um, on the bar, okay? And that should make all that a lot, lot easier. Okay, so I hope that helps us that question. Okay, next question. Question about popping and the tricks associated with it. I can pop, but I find that I get way more lateral motion than vertical motion when I'm in the air. I watch these videos and everybody seems to be doing these nice, gentle, floaty pops, but I feel more like I'm ramping off the water and then traveling a distance downwind rather than going upward. Right, okay, that is actually really, really simple. Well, it's really, really simple to answer, not so easy to do. What you need to do, get the kite higher. You're probably going in with the kite at about 45 degrees. To get pop, to get real kind of floaty pop, you want the kite more at kind of 11 o'clock or 1 o'clock. Now the problem often comes is that riding with the kite that high, you start to lose power. So you need to be fairly nicely powered as well. So if you're really trying to go for a nice big floaty pop, you might want to put up you know, a slightly bigger kite size, especially if you say you ride on flat water, excuse me, you might want to put up a slightly bigger kite size, so just, especially to start with, so that you can get the feel of it. Because often when you're trying to do this pop, you know, you bring the kite to 11 o'clock, you ride and oh, and all the power dies. And suddenly you, know, you try to do this pop and there's no power. So you bring the kite down lower because there's more power and it's easy to hold the power there. And then when you come to the pop, you just go down. <coughs> excuse me. Oh, excuse me. Downwind. <laughs> you just go downwind rather than up. So that's what two things I would say. Obviously, have bring the kite higher. But if you're finding that by bringing the kite higher, you're losing power as you ride into the pop, bigger kite size. Just to start with, because once you get the hang of it, you can actually start you know, moving the kite at the last minute to put the kite in the right position and generate the power. But just to start with, you want to be able to ride into it with the kite 11 o'clock, nicely powered to get that nice big floaty bounce into it. Okay? Second question from the same chat. Any tips for getting comfortable down looping? I can pull them off in carved transitions, but want to get more comfortable with it and have things have a pathological fear of the huge amount of power that a down loop creates. Yeah, that is absolutely normal. Couple of things I would say here. The easiest way to do it, rather than as you say, putting up a smaller kite, the easy way is to put up a smaller kite, to go out underpowered and practice it on a day when you are underpowered. Failing that, ride downwind. Point your board almost straight downwind and then down loop it fast, because if you're already going downwind, it takes a lot of the grunt out of it. Okay, so yeah. Riding along normally, really, really bear off downwind and then pull the down loop. And then as you get more comfortable with it, just change the angle of the board to be going slightly more upwind. Because obviously the more upwind you're going when you down loop it, the more aggressive that pull's going to be because you're almost moving against the kite. As soon as you start moving towards the kite, that'll be a lot more gentle. You'll mean you have to, do, you'll have to steer it even harder because the steering's going to go a bit slacker. But it means that even if it goes wrong, the worst thing is you're going to get pulled a little bit over the front of your board, not get ripped off and flung downwind. So that would be my first one. 
right head downwind and then pull one. Second one, obviously, I put up a smaller kite. The third one, the key with any kind of loop is commit. You know, even if you have to axe handle it, so two hands on the bottom of the on the, the end of the bar, sorry, and yank, you know, in just do not bottle it halfway through because that's when the that's when this pathological fear kicks in. You let go, and that's when things get nasty because the kite just plummets and you end up flying over the front, or you end up doing a really big loop, whereas what you're actually aiming for is a really small loop. Why? Because it keeps the you know the power's on off quick. And the guy doesn't have time to build up this huge amount of power. So you want to really, really commit huge big steer, hold it. And I bet you when you get it, you actually realize, you know, most people's reaction when they do this right is, oh, is that it? Did the guy even loop? You know, so when you do a really small one, there's actually very little power there. It's when you do the big one. The big one's when you go, oh, I'm not really sure about this. Or you get half around and you bottle it. And that's when it gets nasty. Well, not nasty, but that's when it gets... That's where you get this pathological fear from. So axe handle it or just really commit, hold on, and I bet you'll be surprised, huh, is that it? And you'll be doing them all day from there on, okay? So that would be my top tips for, for down looping. But it's a really, really good thing to try, especially if you're out of that sort of, you know, where you're just mastering carve transitions, you may be thinking about riding the surfboard, things like that. This is an awesome thing to try because it means even if you kite's out of position before you come to, to carve, you can escape by pulling it down and it really does do a really nice carve. So, you know, it pulls it, it's a really nice way of doing a carve transition. And actually what you'll probably find is after a while, it's your preferred method of, of carving because it actually becomes a bit easier because that slingshot effect actually pulls you out really nicely. And you can start doing loads of other tricks with it as well. You know, once you start kite looping, the world kind of, especially in, in with twin tip riding, the world kind of opens up to you and all kind of cool tricks open up. And as I say, most of the time you're actually, you know, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. We just have to get over it in here, which is the hard part. Okay, so that's the questions we've come through on today, guys. What we're going to do now, I'm going to switch over to a recording of one of the, the calls that we do in our Kite Surfing Performance Academy. For those of you who haven't heard, this is something that we've started up as a coaching program over the course of a year to really, really get you guys from wherever you're at to wherever you want to be. And this is a super, super intense, super kind of hands-on year where we, you know, I get personally involved all the time helping you guys through. And one thing of the things we do on this course is video feedback calls. So the guys go out, they record some video of what they're doing at the time, they send it in to me, we have, a, we have a call, and I give them coaching on the video on the call. So what I want to do now is switch over to one of the calls from this week. This is with a chap called Ronan, um, who is practicing uh, his carve transitions. So I'll switch over to that, have a look at the video, and that will, that will kind of show you, A, talks you through the carve transition, talks through the things we've talked about here, but also gets an idea of what we do in the Performance Academy. If you are interested in the Performance Academy, send me an email to admin at tantrumkitesurf.com with the words, let's do it in the title, and I'll send you back all the information. I will also put a link in the show notes below to a, a link where you can get a little more information about what we do in there if you are interested. But it is an awesome thing. It's really, really great. I love doing it. And the guys going through it, uh, they're in kite surfing. He's coming on absolute leaps and bounds. It would be awesome to see you in there, guys. So yeah, so link will be in the show notes below. Hit that up. I'd love to see you in there. If not, I'll pass you over to my other self, myself early this morning, who was sat, on, sat outside on the terrace, chilling out in the sun while having this call. And um, you can see, see what Roman's got to show you on the on toe side and car transitions. And I'll catch you again on the other side of the video. Okay, see you then. Cool, so let's have a quick look. Can you see this? I can see that, yep. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I sent you kind of two clips. The first one was, was something that, this is a fairly light day now, but um, I'm doing something wrong. When I just switched over to toe side, uh, just to, to start to turn, but yeah. I, just, I don't know what I'm doing, but I just find myself getting depowered. Yeah, right, a little bit. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Probably something pretty basic I'm doing wrong. And then the second one is a bit better, but I'm still, I don't think I'm moving the kite fast enough and leaning back uh, far enough as I'm coming around. That was actually pretty nice, that second one. Look, okay, at, no, look no. at your, look at your, the key thing there, look at your, can you see my mouse cursor? Yeah, I can actually, yeah. Look at, look at the curve, look at the, yeah, this is what you're looking at really. What you want is that nice and smooth. And that's beautiful. I mean, that's a real way where, where this, this starts going wrong is if there's a huge spot where you're dragging off downwind or if it's much more kind of a right angle. 
Okay. Whereas that's a really nice curve coming out of that one. Let's, have, let's go back and have a look. This, this first one should be fairly. And then it just drops off the power here. Yeah, I reckon I know what that is. This is actually quite counterintuitive. Because what if you look what you're, what you're doing, look at the angle of your board as you go, look at the angle of your, your wake as you're riding. Yep. You see how you shift? So you've come probably, I don't know, 40 degrees, and you're now riding towards the kite. Yeah. So if you look at the angle of your board, your board is, is pointing straight down your lines. Mm. Whereas here, when you're riding in, your board isn't. Your board is pointing about 40 degrees off your lines. Okay, so I lose power then once I, once I head downwind like that. I'm just losing yeah, power. Yeah, because if like... you think about what happens when you're heading downwind, even if you rode downwind here, you know, in, on your heel side, as soon as you start riding downwind, again, it's this idea of, of if you're walking, if you've got a five knot wind blowing and you walk towards the wind, into the wind, you know, you now feel 10 knots at five knots, you're walking at five knots, you now feel 10 knots on your face. But if you turn around and walk the other way, the same direction as the wind at five knots, there's no wind. Yeah, because you're walking at the same speed as the wind. So now, as you start to head towards the kite here, you've reduced the effective wind speed. Yep. Yeah. Because sense. let's say the wind's at 15 knots and you're traveling towards the kite at 10 knots, now there's only five knots in the kite. So this is the classic one. So what you need to actually do is get fully around. Get more of wind, basically. Yeah. So yeah, so, so, get, you, so get your board at that angle again. So rather than it being at, at this angle pointing down lines, you need it back facing. So it's that 40 degrees around further up wind because then you can really edge against the kite and that will generate, that means the kite's got more wind. Yep, makes sense. Yep. Yeah. It's like going yeah. downwind on a, on a sailboat. Once you go downwind, it feels like it's horrible. It hasn't. Exactly. Yeah. It hasn't. Right. It's just you're moving with it. Yeah. It's that, that's the, you know, a run is always the worst point of sail on any yeah. craft because you are, you're losing wind as you're doing it. And it's the same in kind. As soon as you start running, I mean, this is a broad reach, I suppose, but you know, we can count it as a run because you're heading towards the kite in this sense. Um, yeah. You just lose power. So the way you, you counteract that is, is really. The key to, to toe side riding is really lean out. You know, really it's a lot more aggressive because it's a lot less natural stance than heel side. It has to be a lot more aggressive. Hmm. So you really have to kind of, you know, lean forward, drop your legs into it, really sort of push through your toes. And there's a lot more effort in, you know, heel side is just a case of just throw your weight back. Toe side is actually a more active stance. You know, you know, you you push through your toes, you drive through your toes, to, and you fling yourself forwards to really get yourself on that toe side edge. And and the other one I would advise is a lot of back toe pressure. Okay. To really crack. Now the problem is you've got to be careful with this because it's very easy to overdo it as well. And it's because you're not very efficient in this stance, you lose wind that way as well. So this now becomes a real kind of playoff between pushing too much power through and not enough just a question on that then so when i'm and maybe it might be a bit more visible if we move it on to the next one where yeah. i get around a bit better when you're when you're rolling riding toast side, side like that um should no i'm sorry fall in. Should, should um should my chest be facing um like should i be kind of facing my chest almost directly towards the water like yes should i be yeah. um kind of twisted around yeah you know? well it's it's difficult to i would say let's go back because you, you you had it quite nice here where was it did you come into this there it's it's hard yeah you you kind of do because the way that you again think to the wakeboard in the way that you you kind of transfer that weight to the toe side is that you close your shoulders down yep so as we said, as we said with heel side riding, you want to open your chest up and point your nipples where you're going. With toe side riding, it's the opposite. You want to bring that shoulder round in front of you and close your chest down. Now it's difficult because obviously you've also got the kite on that hand. Yeah. And this is why toe side riding in kite surfing is quite difficult because you are kind of twisting 
two ways at the same time. So I would say here, get your chest further round and throw your arm out. So, you know, your arm's really coming out inside, but your chest is really closed down if you can. So my chest is basically facing further upwind than it is there. Is what basically, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's what I would aim for. Yeah, again, again, think about nipples. Nipples pointed towards the water and directly upwind of you, really, if you can. Okay. Fly around there as you can. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine let's, just, that. let's just have a look at this turn and see, because this looks all right to me, actually. You could definitely, you could definitely whip the kite through faster, mm. for sure. I mean, at this point, you are, you know, there from here to here, kind of thing. Oh, I can't do this on YouTube. You are, you just, you, you want that downwind patch to be as small as possible. I mean, this is the best one I've seen you do. This is the, the best one by a mile, but you could just make it a little bit more snappy just by throwing the kite a bit faster. Okay. But again, I mean, looking at the looking at the arc coming out there, that's that's a beautiful arc. That's perfect. Yeah, I just think you would. It's just a point here where you just look. Where is it? Let's go back. Where you just look a little bit here. So this bit here, you know, oh, you could fall back. You could you could be bounced out, and that would be. I mean, I'm nitpicking here. But that would be solved by really flinging that kite through. So you're just being slung shot around the whole way. So there's never any sort of weight distribution problems because it's just natural where you put your weight. Okay. But I wouldn't stress too much about that. I would keep doing what you're doing because I say, look at that angle coming out. It's perfect. That's perfect. Okay, cool. You could probably just make it a bit smaller, make it a bit narrower that turn so you're not losing as much ground downwind if you wanted to. But again, you know, you don't need to. That's, that's a nice turn, that one. Yeah, and the key to do that is just again just to fling the kite a lot more aggressively than I am. Exactly, yeah. The yeah. kite, what you're doing now with the board and your weight distribution is great. All you need to start doing now is flinging the kite harder and lower. Hmm. If you look at like the real good wave riders, their kite, their kite goes like two meters off the water, horizontally in front of them. Humph. It's a yeah. really quick heel to toe side transition, and it's just you're just being pulled through by the kite the whole way. And that's what you're eventually aiming for. Now, I wouldn't worry too much about that now, but, but the key things to think about on this now is move the kite a bit faster, get the kite a bit lower. A bit lower, okay. Yeah, and, and work on those two things. Yeah, that's great. So I have another question for you unrelated yeah. to, to this, and, and that is um, I, uh, I tore a rotator cuff kite surfing a couple of years ago. And yeah. so I've only really kind of started again, I guess, in... Really, when I come over to you guys in, in I suppose, April, May. Yeah. Um, so I'm a bit nervous on my shoulder. So what, one of the things I've been trying to do is um, uh, think about popping. And I, and I keep checking out on it because uh, it just feels like when I, if I go upwind and then try and pop, I'm going to put strain on my shoulder. And I guess the question I have is that um, is, is, when, you, when you pop, is there a, quite a strain on both your shoulders when you're just trying to pop out of the water that no no away. not at all no when you what, what you when you start to start worrying is if you unhook but actually okay. popping there's no there should be no strain on your shoulders whatsoever mm, okay anything you're doing hooked in shouldn't have any strain on your shoulders whatsoever it should always be this one finger flying basically okay okay so when With i'm any I'm, so, go on. sorry go ahead any strain should be coming through your harness. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, Which is why a so, strong core is so important. Yeah. So when I look to pop then, the, the, the feeling I should be thinking about, once I've, once I've gone downwind, got picked up speed, and then I'm, I'm carving hard upwind, mm -hmm. the, pop, the, the thought process that I should have is to lift my, my front foot and stamp on my back foot. Is that the... That's not what I would recommend. No, that is one... T that's, like, that's more like an ollie. Okay. But what we're looking for is not using the board. You try to use the kite. So while that is a valid type of pop, that's more the pop that you would generate off a surfboard. Okay. Strapless. You know, it's like a skateboard pop. Whereas what we're looking to do is just, what you do is you ride, the easiest way to explain it is to think of a wave, okay? All you can do is a little, a little ramp, a little wave that's a ramp coming towards you. Now you, you, look at the wave the last minute you turn straight directly into the wave so you are perpendicular to that wave mm -hmm. yeah that's that little that and this is the last half a second you turn into the wave 
then as you come off the top of the wave, all you do is you release your edge. So you push through your toes rather than your heels and you pull the bar in with the kite at about 45, 45 to, well, sort of half past 10 to 11 o'clock. Ah, okay. Okay. That's not at all what I was thinking. So that, that sounds easier. So basically I push with both my toes, release with both my toes and pull in the bar. That's basically it. Yeah. Because what you're, what you're after is that the, you don't, the board doesn't do this. The kite rips you off the water. Ah, okay. Okay. Your board is trying to grip to the last moment. And what that does is it stacks tension between, well, in the lines, basically, because the kite doesn't respond instantly in its dynamic line. So rather than static, so the kite doesn't follow you exactly. The, the lines actually stretch and stack with power. Mm. And then just before the kite does move towards you to release all the power, you release the board and that's what pulls you into the air. Oh, okay. You know, I, th I think what I'm thinking about is uh, jumping on a windsur windsurfer and chop. That's yeah, no, it's, no it's not like that at all. No, no, forget about that. The board does nothing in, in this because, because it's such a small board and we're strapped in. We don't want the board to actually to initiate this. It's all done from the kite because that's yeah. a lot more powerful. Yep. Okay. So when I, pull in the, when I pull in the kite, keep it at 45, pull in the kite, I don't necessarily need to raise the kite, I just keep it at that for level. Pop, for in. pop, you shouldn't be raising the kite. For pop, you should be, the idea of pop is that the kite stays still. Okay. And as we move to jumping, then we'll start introducing the kite, but just for pop, keep the kite exactly where it is. Okay. That's and again, a really, good, a really good way to do this is just, just use waves to start with, just cheat. Just use waves, because that will get you the idea of what's going on. It gets you the in the air control and all this stuff. And then you can start thinking, okay, I get this now. And this is how I work the board on yep. flat water. Okay. Um, but, but start by cheating. Start by cheating with waves. It's a really okay. much easier way of doing it. And it will get you the idea of, yeah, I don't need to use the board. It's all the kite. Okay. And okay. you know when you've got it, because the feeling is, and this took me ages to understand, but the feeling actually is, is that you are about to be, you know when, you know when you're first learning and you start skidding, yeah. As you are starting, mm -hmm. you're about to do that. Okay. It's like, I cannot hold this edge down any longer or I'm going to start skidding. And at that point, oomph, you let it go. Yeah. Yeah. Just let your feet go. Pushing your toes and pulling Yeah, the exactly. Let your, yeah. Th your feet go. Pull on the bar. Stand up slightly. Poof, and off you go. And it's, you're only looking, you know, it might only be a foot of air that you're getting. But that's all we need to start with. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and would you recommend doing that before learning to jump by raising the kite? I'd do them both. I'd give yourself a few things to work on. Okay. I'd do both at the same time because they're both, if you're at that level, you're ready to do both. So I mean, pop is, pop is kind of the basis for a lot of things, but pop can be quite frustrating. But what happens is as you start, because it, popping and jumping really is all about timing. So why not work on them both at the same time? You know, do some, because you, you will anyway, you want to tie them together anyway at the end. So why not let's work on them both at the same time? So do, do somewhere you're just popping, somewhere you're just trying to jump by using the kite and then start mixing them together and then start mixing them together with waves as well, because that's when you really go aerial. Yeah, yeah, okay. And the other key thing then is, is to bend your knees. Once you're up, bend your knees. Is that, is that right? Or does it matter? It's what, what you're actually after. The, the best, what you're trying to do is stop yourself rotating whilst you're jumping. If you're talking about pop, all you've got to really think about is pointing your board downwind for your okay. landing. You want to land with your board pointed in the direction of travel. That's all I would be thinking about when I'm in the air then. Jumping is slightly different, but again, I don't think you get to worry about that too much. But when you do start getting, you know, hang time, then what you're trying to avoid is rotating in the air. And there's a really simple grab that you can do, which does tend to stop that. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't stress too much about, about what you do with your legs. Just all you worry about at the moment is making sure that your, your board is pointed when you're landing in the direction that you're actually traveling. So your board mm -hmm. is pointing downwind. Everything else, don't worry about your legs. You're going to be too busy thinking about other things to start with. Okay. Okay, good. I'll try that because that's, uh, that's the next logical thing for me. Yeah, 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 for sure, yeah. And then once you get that, you know, once you're starting to pop and things, then you can start looking at back rolls, front rolls, all this other cool stuff. But again, none of this should be putting pressure through your, your shoulder because okay. I say everything should be coming through you. Well, everything will be coming through your harness as long as you're hooked in. Great. Okay, well, that's the next thing then. Yep, perfect, perfect. Good, good. Well, let me know you get on with that. I expect to see some videos of that in the next few weeks then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm down. There's a there's a thing called Battle for the Lake in Ackle in the west of Ireland. Uh, not next weekend. Weekend after next. Uh, right. 
I'll be going down to that. This should be maybe about a hundred kiters down for a weekend. There's oh, a awesome. freshwater lake, and then there's a beach behind that, and, and uh, a lot of racing and all that. And there's a guy called Lenten. Is yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ruben Lenten. He's a legend. If you get a chance to chat to him, talk to me. Really, really nice guy, and really okay. approach, really approachable. You know, he's not one of these pros who's up his own half. You go and have a chat with him. He will give you the time of day, and he's a super nice guy. Yeah. Good. Good. And he's a very, he's an amazing guy to watch on the water. He is just fearless. Yeah, he's going to be doing some demos, I believe. So yeah, it's special. brilliant. Well worth a watch. Well worth a watch. He's one of Kai Serpin's best, if not the best ambassador we've got. He's a legend. Okay, good. Good. Excellent. So it's just nice me. One. I think it is, yeah. Just you. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. So good. That's, well, that's, that's just Thank you for that. No problems. No problems. I'll try and get some more video to you over the next... Yeah, uh, nice one. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, as I say, that I think Paolo's back as well. And I think a few of the other guys are saying they're going to try and get out this autumn. So we should have a few more videos coming on. So this should be, should be starting to get a bit more, a bit more video stuff going on. Yeah, that's cool. Actually, sorry, one, I've got one more question for you. Which, yeah, go on. Uh, yeah. So I have a... Um, I'm about 83 kilos. On board, I have is a, a 136... Uh, what is it? A North Hamey or whatever it is. Yeah. And I find an awful lot that I'm... Um, I can see other people around me on the same size kite, but they're just seem to be much more power than me. They're, they're not, you know, I seem to be bouncing around a lot in the water and yeah. having to move the kite a lot. Is that board a bit, um, like, is it worthwhile looking at it something that's a bit more um, bigger or more buoyant or whatever, or is it just my technique? You could do. I would suggest, poss- I mean, first of all, find out what, kind of what boards they're riding. Yeah. The first thing, are they riding boards that are much bigger? Are they weigh more than you? Do they weigh less than you? That's the first thing I would look at. A 136 for your kind of height is pretty good, to be honest. Is it? Okay. You could, I mean, I ride a 135 and I'm about 90 kg. Hmm. Now, I could get away with a 138 quite happily, and I have got away with a 138, and I like a 138. Um, but for the sake of buying a new board, I would suggest probably without, without, Put too fine a point. It's probably more technique oh, yeah, it's than anything right. else. I yeah. would imagine. I mean, yeah, you know, 138 will make a difference for sure. You know, it would make it. You notice a difference. It will be easier. But I would suggest rather than going and spending money on a new board, I would suggest a 136 is actually fine for what you're trying to do. And it's probably just a case of, of honing your technique to point. I mean, as you get better, you know, one of the big things you can see about the guys that are and you know, have been kiting a while, even if they're not doing tricks and things like that, you just become a lot more efficient. Mm, a yeah. lot, you know, and you can you can have a kite that's three meters less than somebody else, and you can be outperforming them upwind wise, just because you're using that power more effectively. Yep. Okay. Um, so I wouldn't stress too much about the board. And like, yeah, I mean, it does certainly could. There's always an argument about having a light wind board. But if I was going to go down that route, I wouldn't think about a 138. I'd think about a 150 or something like that and really go, right, this is my light wind board. I'm going to use Yeah, that. I'll think about you a know. surfboard maybe or whatever. Or a yeah. surfboard, yeah, something yeah. like that. You know, definitely, from your level of surfboard is definitely a thing you could be thinking about if you wanted to. Yeah, for sure. Cool. For sure. It's, it's, well, Jill, I mean, Jill, Jill is pretty much the same level as you are. And she's got a surfboard now and she's riding it and she's fine on it. So, mm. okay. It's, it's definitely something you can think about. Yeah, there's always something to buy. There is. Of course there is. Of course there is. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, good stuff. I well, appreciate that, Sam. That's really helpful. No problems, mate. No problems. Yeah, good. Good. Okay, guys. So that's it for this week. Great to speak to you again. As always, any questions for me, Sam at tantrumkitesurf.com. If you're interested in the Kitesurfing Performance Academy, and you should be because it's awesome, Hit me up at admin at tantrumkaisov.com or sam at tantrumkaisov.com, which that's more detail, doesn't matter which one. Or there's a link in the show notes below to where we've got a load more information about it for you guys who are interested in that. So have a look at that as well. And I will speak to you next week, guys. Have a great time on the water and chat to you soon.